I work at a hospital. So my job is to help people get stronger when they're sick and after they've been deemed medically stable. So I'd like to tell you about a patient that I had about a year ago. His name was Paul. So when Paul was admitted to the hospital, he was a very sick above knee amputee. So his left leg, if I remember correctly, had been amputated above his knee. The way my job works is that a supervisor will take on a case and once they see the patient and evaluate the patient, they'll come to me and they'll say, okay, here's the plan of care. Here's what we need to do and let's execute. So the supervisor who I'll say her name is Clarissa. It's not her real name. But Clarissa came to me and said, hey, I have a guy upstairs for you on the ward. His name is Paul. He wants to be a prosthetic candidate. He wanted to be able to eventually earn a left leg prosthesis. The process for earning a prosthetic leg is quite extensive. It's not a matter of just coming to the hospital and they strap a leg on you and say, okay, good luck. There's an extensive training process that goes along with it. So in his stay on the floor, I had to be able to see him hop with a standard walker 150 feet and his vitals had to be stable. And of course I had to be very careful about any symptomatic abnormalities. So, I went up to meet him and he was a very sweet man, probably about five foot seven, salt and pepper hair, a uh, little goatee, glasses, just a nice, nice sweet man. And I said, hi, my name is John and I'd like to do X, Y, and Z. And he said, okay, sounds good. Now sometimes, especially at the hospital I work at, some of the patients can be quite ornery and very mean and they don't want to do anything. And I don't blame them, honestly. When you're suffering with various medical complications, the last thing you want is some young, dumb punk with long hair coming into your room and going, come on, let's exercise, bro. But Paul was different. Paul was nice. And he said, sure, no problem. He did his hopping and he would come back to his bedside recliner and I would check his blood pressure. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that his systolic blood pressure would oftentimes be above 200 millimeters of mercury. Now, just to give you context, the average adult blood pressure, a good healthy number, is generally considered to be around 120 over 60 millimeters of mercury. Paul was pushing into the 200s, but in accordance with what the medical team had deemed appropriate, this was permissible. I would check with him, do you have any headache, any lightheadedness, any chest pain, any visual field alterations? No, 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 and so forth. And on that went for a couple weeks, every day. He was determined, he worked hard, and as it turns out, he wanted a prosthetic leg because he wanted to be able to walk his daughter down the aisle. <laughs> if I wrote this in a movie, you would accuse me of being overtly sappy, but this is real. So. He qualifies to be a prosthetic candidate. From this process, he's discharged home, and then he is readmitted about a month later to begin prosthetic training in earnest. Now, when you begin prosthetic training, they admit you to the sub-acute rehab facility within the hospital. So Paul came back and Clarissa said, hey, would you like to be treating him again? And I said, absolutely. So what she had me do is I would exercise stretch him out and help him get strong and limber in the morning time. And then she would help him do the prosthetic walking and all the measurements and the fitting and everything that goes into getting a prosthetic leg in the afternoon. So he was what we call BID or twice per day. So he had a lot of work ahead of him, but he was determined to walk his daughter down the aisle. So 
For several weeks, I went down to his bedside because he preferred it. He liked me to come down in the morning and I would stretch his hip flexors and taught him how to activate his lower back muscles and his glutes and all this other cool stuff and just wanted him to get stronger before his prosthetic training in the afternoon. So every day I would go in at 8.30 and he would be sitting in his wheelchair ready to go. He had his face shaved, he had his teeth brushed and he was ready to go. And I really appreciated that about him. So I would come in, I would check his starting blood pressure, his resting blood pressure, and then we would converse and then I'd say, okay, let's get to work. And on we would go. So on a Monday morning, and I remember it was Monday because the Sunday prior I had gone to a major sporting event uh, downtown in the city nearby. And on that day, there had been a baseball game that was supposed to have happened the day before, but it got rained out and now it was the same day as the other sporting event, which was a hockey game that I went to. Traffic was real crazy. We got to the game late, so on and so forth. So Monday morning, I go into Paul's room and there he is sitting there, he's asleep in his chair. And I walk in and I say, hey, good morning, Paul. And he kind of opens his eyes and smiles a little and says, hey, John, how's it going? And I said, oh, how was your weekend, buddy? And, you know, how, how's that going in the hospital? And he said, oh, it's not too bad. You know, as far as hospital goes, the food sucks and blah, 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 right? And I said, well, you're not going to believe my weekend. Oh, my goodness. We went to see the hockey game. We went to see blah, blah, blah. And there was a major event that happened during the baseball game. And he goes, oh, I saw that major event at the baseball game on TV. That's so cool that you guys got to be down there when that happened. And I said, oh, it was great, but oh, the traffic sucked. And my father-in-law who was with me hates traffic. And he was complaining the whole time. Oh, and then we couldn't find parking. And you're not going to believe all the trouble we went through, right? I'm bitching about my weekend. I turn my back to him and I run the machine. Uh, and I just sit there talking to him and I'm going, oh, traffic this and hockey that. And so I turned around and I, I said, Paul, uh, what do you want to get up to today? His face began to contort like he was about to sneeze, which is what I thought he was doing at first. So he reels back and his face is contorted. And then I realized that this is something else. His face basically looked like it was a candle melting. So one side of his face goes completely slumped. And I thought, oh my God, Paul's having a stroke. But then I saw his arms tighten up so I immediately jumped over, knocked off the blood pressure cuff, and I, Paul, are you okay? Paul, is everything okay? He was unresponsive. His arms were, I mean, like bricks. Every sarcomere must have been going crazy. Every fiber of muscle was as solid as it could possibly be. So I go out into the hallway, and there's a couple nurses sitting there on their phones and whatnot, and I said, I need help right now. One of the nurses kind of half-acid looked up at me like, uh, and I shouted and I won't yell into the mic, but I said, I need help right now. I was pissed. So they came running over and I hit the code button. There's a physician's assistant. Her name is, we'll call her Tanya. It's not her real name. So Tanya comes running down the hall and she's, Tanya's cool, man. She's really smart. She's very, very sharp and she knows her job very well. So she comes running down the hall. I tell her briefly what's going on. The code has already been called. So she goes, okay, we need to get him out of this wheelchair and onto the bed right now. I think he's having a seizure. I said, okay. And you know, when they talk about mom strength, you get that mom adrenaline. Well, I got a version of that, and I basically lifted this man up uh, like a biceps curl and lifted him into his bed, and we turned him on his, I remember, his left side. So Tanya goes over to the side of the bed, and she goes, oh, shit. Now, like I said, Tanya's a professional, so for her to be cursing in that sort of scenario meant something was really wrong. So she goes, John, help me turn him over on his back. So I helped turn him over, and as soon as I saw his face, I knew it was over. Paul, who is a white man, he's a Caucasian man, 
his skin went from light to paper white, and he was completely unresponsive. I mean, his eyes were rolled into the back of his head. Here comes the code team. They come barreling down the hall. They have a crash cart, which has all sorts of life-saving equipment. There's a team that's dedicated to these calls. They come running into the room, and my job at that point was just to get out of the way. So I backed up into the corner. Thankfully, it was a very large room, and it can fit a lot of people in it. So I backed up and let the crash cart come in, let the team come in, and I just sort of stood there in a in a sort of a funk because I was sort of shocked at what I was seeing. I was, you know, I have training. I realized what was happening and I was very pragmatic about it. And I knew that this isn't good, but I was still in shock, especially because this was such a nice man. I was just having a pleasant conversation with this man 60 seconds ago, and now he's dying. I walked out into the hallway. Uh, there was a, another person from my department out there. She said, are you okay? And I said, I'm just a little shaken up right now. I just need some time. And I said, I think I should go back up to our department and just sort of let this team do their work. So I did, I went back up to my department and I passed by my boss's office. And he's a very pleasant, polite man. And he said, hey, do you need anything? And normally I just say, oh, no, thank you. Thank you for asking and carry on. But given what just happened, I basically just stumbled into his office and said, you're not going to believe what just happened. So I got the word that Paul had been resuscitated. He had been revived and they were taking him up to the intensive care unit, which is on the fifth floor. And I thought, great. So I'm talking to my boss about what's going on as I get this information. And I said, well, they were able to resuscitate him at least. That's good. There's a chance. And as soon as my boss says, okay, well, I hope it works out. There's an announcement that goes out over the PA that says code one, which is, you know, unresponsive, essentially. And we both knew what that meant. And he just said, I'm sorry. And I said, thank you. I need to go leave the office and go kind of take a walk. So I go down the hall and I'm by the sink that's near our sort of main department area. Another colleague from another department, our sister department, comes over and she says, hey, I heard what happened. Are you OK? And I said, yeah, I'm a little freaked out, but hopefully they're able to revive him. Hopefully they can work some sort of miracle. Just then I see Clarissa the supervising therapist walking down the hall and her face is red and she's got tears uh, coming down her cheeks. And I just went, oh, fuck. And I gave her a big hug and she started sobbing and I stayed strong for her because that's what I needed to be at that moment. And she said, he's gone. Paul's gone. And I went up to the fifth floor where he was, and I saw his family members and a couple of doctors in his room. And there he was under a blanket, laying completely still, of course. And the family was very emotional, obviously. And there's a gal that works at the front desk of that floor of the ICU. I can't remember her name. I've only ever spoken to her once, and it was when this happened very, very cool uh, gal. And she said, hey, is there anything I can help you with? And I said, well, I was treating Paul when this happened. And she goes, oh, man, I'm really sorry about that. And I said, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Now, this particular hospital, there's an honor that's bestowed upon the men and women who pass away in this hospital. And I said, are they getting ready to do this honor? And she said, well, they'll probably do it soon. Do you want me to call you when it happens? And I said, yes, please, that would be amazing. So she took my extension down for the little cell phone that I carry on my hip, and I just went back downstairs. I had another patient scheduled to come up to our department, so I figured, you know what, I should probably just keep working to take my mind off this stuff. I get a phone call, and it's the gal at the desk uh, at the ICU, and she says, hey, they're about to do the honor, you should come up now. 
So I told my patient, I said, sir, there's a bit of a thing that I have to make it to. Can you please wait for me? And he said, no problem at all. He was, he was really cool. So I ran upstairs and as I'm, and I'm literally running down the hall. And as I'm running down the hall, I can hear the music. I turn a corner and I see a bunch of the custodial staff who were all part of this shared organization that Paul was a part of and that I was a part of at one time. And all the custodial members are standing in a row and they're all holding a salute. I ran up right next to a custodial staff member and I raised my hand in the sharpest salute I have ever given. And just as I hit that salute, they wheeled Paul right by me in a, um, I don't know how else to say this. They wheeled him by in a box. Uh, it was a blue box. I remember plastic completely covered and I kept my hand sharp and high until he passed by and the music stopped. And then I put my arm down. I really appreciate you listening. Thank you. I gotta sort it out.